for those of you that were here earlier today and or were watching earlier today, um, we got a sense of how our awareness of language and our philosophies around language help to define the contexts for how we relate with each other and all of life. That in fact, every bridge that we build with another person involves language. That our communion itself is built from the language that we use. And underlying the language that we use is the unfolding mystery of who we are. The different sounds that Zadik brought forward, these different animal spirits, these are like different energetic elemental impulses within us, seeking to be let free, parts of ourselves. We are spectral beings. We have physical needs, we have emotional needs, we have mental needs, we have interpersonal needs, we have communicative needs with each other, we have spiritual needs. We have lots of different needs as beings. And those needs are not mutually exclusive. They don't exist independently, and yet they also drive us independently. Because when we're hungry, we want food. We don't want to necessarily get into an emotional process, <laughs> right? When we're, when we're trying to figure out a solution of a problem, we want to focus our mind and not get overwhelmed by the fact that we're hungry. Right? So we create containers that allow our consciousness to move and operate in different ways. This is just how it works to be in a body. It's like piloting spaceship Apollo at the moment, right? But fortunately, my hunger needs are met. I have done a little bit of my emotional processing by grieving for a loved one that I lost recently. I had a huge amount of mental stimulation by the amazing insights of one of the Residence Academy students that's here with us here today. And my heart is deeply opened by the presence and the love and the dedication that these people here have to the future of Earth. So I think I'm in a good place to give you guys a little bit of a transmission. Does that sound good? Yeah. All right. This transmission is about how we create an actual practical structure that you can use to protect and secure your sovereignty legally in interface with the rest of the world and actually create a container that you can pass along to your children, that you can pass along to your beloveds, that you can pass along to your tribe, if you like, that actually holds and protects everything within it, including your body, your money, your assets, whatever you want to be in it. And when I say your body, I mean, yeah, actually your body. Legal protection that allows you to establish that your body exists within a trust agreement that falls under, as we call, common and natural law, and that is impenetrable and does not fall within statutory law or the jurisdiction of statutory law, which is what our entire legal system and court system is based on. What I'm going to be sharing with you today is an output of a lot of different pieces of work of different people over a long time. There's a gentleman named Carl Weiss that I'll talk about where who really surfaced a lot of these keys and I will honor and acknowledge him now and I will honor and acknowledge him later. I also want to honor and acknowledge the gentleman at a place called the Private Wealth Academy who did the best job I've ever seen of assembling the resources and templates of this work into one simple package that you can take and work with. By the end of this presentation, I'm going to give you QR codes to both access all the legal templates, all the instructions on exactly how to do this for yourselves, and I'm going to give you another QR code to access Private Wealth Academy so that if you want to take their course and listen to these guys illustrate for you why and how this works over many hours of video and additional resources, you have that too. Sound good? Good? All right, let's do this. For those of you on Zoom, you'll just miss my pretty face because you're just going to get my slides. All right. 
So, I like to call this the Invincible Trust Secrets. As we dive in here, what we're going to cover is a few uh, really essential elements of the understanding of how to use legal language and approach the financial systems as well as legal systems, particularly in the United States. However, there are similar structures in almost every country around the world where simple permutations of this same process can be used and are being used currently by many of the wealthiest and most powerful people in the world. The key elements of this presentation are covering the truth of trusts, the keys of trustees, what does it mean to be a trustee, how do you operate as a trustee, the power of the trust web as an effective structure that can hold companies, corporations, organizations, tokens, and other kinds of structures, and what lawful money is. Um, as I shared earlier today, each bill that we carry in our pocket actually has two different forms. It's both a U.S. Treasury note and it's a Federal Reserve debt note. It exists as both and you have to opt to choose to use it as a U.S. Treasury note and tell your bank you're using it that way for it to become lawful money. And as I go, you'll understand a lot more about what that is and why that is and what that means. So in Black's Law's Dictionary, which is one of the big, you know, major law books, what I like to call the major spell books that have cast the structures in which we now use for agreements and to create all of the kinds of things that we create, a trust is the right enforceable solely in equity to the beneficial enjoyment of property to which another person holds the legal title. Sounds like a mouthful. Well, trusts go back a long, long way. If we look at the history of trust law, we see some of the earliest examples of trusts back in 200 BC, uh, again in the Norman conquest of England. And in those days, the general understanding was that the king owns all the land. But the king owning all the land couldn't manage all of that. So what did he do is he found his closest friends and advisors, and he had them basically have a way to control the land, to be entrusted to control the property, and that would happen through something called tenure. Now that's where we get the term tenant from, is lords holding tenure as tenants over the land to help the king manage all the land. The king still owns it all, but the lords and ladies can hold it and protect it, including passing it to their eldest son, for example. And this passing on of uh, generational trust, so to speak, is at the heart of trust law in general. And it's also where we get the idea of estate taxes. Because a family holding an estate, then passing it to the next generation, you know, when that happens, the king gets to make a chunk of money off of all the money and all the wealth and all the earnings taken from that land or, or created in that land or by that lord or lady when that lord or lady passes it on. So the king really wins every cycle here, right? It just takes all that capital back up to the top. We also have in the Magna Carta in England in 1215, a person holding land can pass it on and they call that a beneficiary. And if an heir is under age, a guardian or trustee of the land was appointed until the heir would become of age. And the idea here is, is something that is at the heart of our entire legal system, which is that equity compels performance. Meaning that the nature of the agreement is such that it is beneficial to all the parties in such a way that nobody would want to break the agreement. That everybody would want to keep the agreement because it's good for everybody, right? That's the idea behind our legal system. Believe it or not, that's what it's really trying to do. And, and so we get this idea of the legal owner being the sort of trustee, but is not actually an owner, it's controller, and the beneficial owner, the receiver, being the beneficiary. Now, in, in the 1500s, as you know, Great Britain chartered expeditions to the colonies, and we have uh, all of these guys coming over, really intelligent guys coming over, 
they had a little bit of an issue with the way things were going because creating a colony was going to say, okay, we're going to entrust some control of the colony to the people that are managing it. But the land and anything you find, if you plant a flag there, it's owned by the king, right? Or the queen. And so there's all these guys who are really smart who are in this country, this area, this land, taking it from the natives, raping it, you know, basically getting whatever they want. And they're like, well, this is our land now. Why should we pay the king? <laughs> why, should we, why should we pay taxes to this guy who's across the ocean and is a jerk? You know, why should we do that? This is that we're doing all the work over here. So how do we establish a new formula for this trust where a king does not own it, but that it is actually co-owned and co-created by the people for the people together? Now, of course, you know, we'll all point out the ridiculous, you know, <laughs> fallacy of this in understanding our relationship to the native traditions and the native peoples that were already here on the land, right? But of course, for the purpose of this presentation, I have to just honor and acknowledge that and recognize that, yeah, no, these guys did not control this land, did not control this country. It wasn't real, it was stolen, and that's what we're dealing with. But it is crucial to understand their way of thinking to understand how these legal precedents of language, these spells, passed on and became the foundation for the entire legal system and way of operating that we have today. And these guys, in their minds, were doing a real good thing. And that really good thing that they were doing was declaring independence for the people of the lands in this country, really all the colonists, all the people that migrated over, declaring independence for those people from this other king, breaking the trust, breaking the structure. We are no longer gonna, gonna pay excise taxes. We are gonna claim some sovereignty here. And this was a, a, an original formula of a trust. They used a trust-like structure set up between agreeing people, the colonists with each other to establish this. And they didn't do it quite perfectly. So then what they did is something called the Articles of Confederation, which further evolved the structure of that trust and made it a little bit better. And in the Articles of Confederation, they established that the grantor were the people of the states. So all the people across the lands actually are the true owners of the lands. And they are going to entrust the state representatives with, here, you now control this because we're entrusting you with this. You are now the trustees to ensure that the lands and, and all the money used here gets used well and right for the service of all people. And the beneficiaries, the service of all people being the states and the people of the states. So the people of the states say, hey, why don't you represent me since because we, we can't all go and gather in that council room and you guys figure out the best way to deal with this stuff that's going on and do it for the well-being of all of us. It's where it started. It's just a trust structure, but one that involves a collective making a call and a decision together. The key elements of a trust are very simple. It's got a name, a situs, parties, and governing laws. And what we find is that the U.S. Constitution was sort of the next stage in mastery of the Founding Fathers developing this process and structure of creating a trust that would essentially establish a sovereign barrier of freedom for the people within this country. And that is why in the Constitution, when you begin reading it, it says, we the people, in order to create a more perfect union. It's basically an amendment. Why is they saying more perfect union? Well, because they already were trying to create a perfect union in the prior documents, but they're gonna make an even more perfect union now in this constitution, right? And interestingly enough, as a side note, it's worth mentioning that the United States was also founded as a corporation in London in 1871. Now, that's, you know, a good hundred years later, and we're going to come back to that. But I want to just plant that seed for you for a moment. Like, why would any, at any time, 
these guys and this country that has just established this whole new state of sovereignty, they've just fought a war, they've literally just defended their constitution and established this freedom. Why would a hundred years later, the people within that structure go to London to register and ask for permission to be a corporation? If you guys remember some of my talk earlier today, I pointed out the fact that any time you go and you ask to create a corporation, you ask to set a register something, to create a license to do anything, you are essentially playing along with the spell that's saying, you're not sovereign to make that call on your own. You're going to say, I want you to be the representative for me, and I'm going to ask you to give me the rights that I already inherently have. And when you agree to that, you give me some paperwork that ensures that I really feel secure in those rights and that everybody else knows I've got them. <laughs> okay. You following me? It's a little interesting. All right. We're going to come back to that. So don't worry if you don't get it entirely. When a man assumes a public trust, he should consider himself a public property. Thomas Jefferson. What the guys doing that we're crafting the constitution of this country we're saying is that we are part of a public we are part of a republic we are interconnected we are together and so as we establish this public constitution we are in some sense giving our public rights to each other and to this agreement now this is going to get a lot deeper because it all comes back to that trinity that Zadik was talking about. Except in this case, the Trinity is public and private. And you. And how do you interact with the universe and the world in public and in private? And everything in law, everything in spell work, the language, the magic of all of this stuff comes down to that barrier. What is public and what is private? In the Constitution, there is something that's known as the Contract Clause. It's in Article 1, Section 10, Clause Number 1, and it reads very specifically, No state shall pass any law impairing the obligation of contracts. Now, it says some other things, too, like, you know, can't make money, like coin money, unless the government approves, can't do other things, bill of attainders, I want to get into all that, or grant titles of nobility. They're like, no, 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 no more of that. No more titles of nobility. I'm not doing that anymore. But the real depth of this is critical to understand because this was a back door written in. It was a back door that says, yes, we all are agreeing to this public constitution. We are agreeing to be a part of something together. That's going to establish some fundamental rights and some fundamental gifts. And this is what we're going to agree to as a contract. But we will never allow this agreed contract to impair your ability to make a private contract with somebody else. So the founding fathers were pretty smart. They were like, well, yeah, we should be all together. But I don't want to interfere with you as a person having an agreement with your friend. I don't want to impair that. We should never impair that. In fact, if two people decide they want to do something together, that's up to them always. And no state shall pass any law that impairs that. U.S. Constitution. Okay? The private contract is thus the only form of sovereign agreement that is fully protected by the weight of the Constitution. And it's validated by hundreds of Supreme Court cases. When you scan my QR code later, you'll see it. There's just tons and tons. There's an entire legal library full of them. It's crazy. And it's essentially a sovereign agreement that can operate within a larger state. And I say state with a capital S because it says, no, you and I can do whatever we want to do. And it's not going to affect it it's, can be influenced by whatever powers that be. Those powers that be have no power over you and me. That's the ultimate heart of the magic and the spell. It says, well, so what? We can agree to be in a community, but if you and I want to trade something, we can do that. And the community should have no say over that. Very intelligent. 
So this brings us to one of the real interesting cruxes of this whole game, which comes back to the philosophy of ownership and what ownership actually is. As I briefed a little bit earlier today, do we actually own the land that we're on? You know, the Native American peoples, you just laughed at the cowboys. The cowboys were like, I'm going to call that Smith Mountain, you know? And then the natives were like, what do you, what? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Smith Mountain. <laughs> he thinks it's this mountain, <laughs> you know? We're going to name this river after this person. No, you know, they, they, you, do you actually own the land? Do you own your car? Do you own your house? Are these things actually truly ownable? Can you say that the land that you live on belongs to you and you alone? Well, if you think that the little piece of paper that's, you know, in the courthouse says, since it says you do, that that's what does, then you are a true believer in magic, my friends, <laughs> because it is all magic. And it is all, in this case, illusionary magic. But illusions become real when we agree to them. Magic solidifies when we make agreements. And we are all saying, yes, this is real. And so we've made it real that people own things. However, the truth is, underlying that, that a lot of these ownership ideas that we have, they're faulty. Because there's a fault when it comes to, I own this land, and, but what about the birds that come and go from the land? You know, what, a, what about the stream that's entering and exiting the land? You know, what about the fact that the dust and the seeds change from the land? I mean, we've seen a lot of this in the environmental sector. You guys paid any attention to, you know, what's happened with Monsanto seeds blowing into other fields and contaminating fields of other farmers? Well, I own this land. But I'm planting seeds that now are passing into that land. The division lines are not really clear. They might be on our maps and our little spell cartographies, our you know, geomancy. But do those lines, do those boundaries actually exist? No, they don't. And so Rockefeller and a lot of the guys who are some of the wealthiest people in this world, and I'm not even going to go through the names of the rosters. You probably already know those names. I'll... Almost all of them at some point have said something just like this. The secret to success is to own nothing but control everything. Because these guys are in on the secret that you don't actually own anything. But the power of ownership really, truly only resolves and resides over you and your own corpus, meaning your body. The only thing you truly actually own is your body. That is the truth. And you've got that body. You can create with it. You can do with it. You can grow it. You can kill it. You can do whatever you want with it. It's your body. Ultimate health sovereignty comes down to that edge right there. And yet everything else, to some extent, is really just a matter of control. It's not actually about ownership. And there's a secret baked into our entire tax system and finance system and law system that's based on this little piece of truth right here. So there's something called a private irrevocable express trust. A private trust is something that says it's created by a natural right. In other words, it's not liable to statutes, meaning it's not liable to statutory law. It's your natural right to have a private agreement with another person. An irrevocable trust says a trust cannot be revoked or recalled. It exists. It can be amended. The board of trustees can change it. But it all has to remain in accord with the spirit of the contract. An express trust is a trust made by its maker rather than by law. It's not liable to statutes unless it quotes or finds foundation in such laws, meaning that you create it yourself. And if you bake into it rules that are in the jurisdiction of statutory law, then you're basically giving the court the power over you. 
you determine that the court has power over you by choosing to use the spells that they use that are compatible with their system inside of their way of doing prosecution and etc. Right? So at the heart of this, this is basically saying it's your natural right to do it. It's literally infinite. It's unrevocable. You know, it's powerful. It will continue to exist whether you're alive or not. And it's done expressly from you, by you, for you, done. Nobody else says you can do it or not. And there's a lot of notable foundations for these kinds of trusts, namely the North American Land Company created by Alexander Hamilton. Know that name? Founding father of the United States, right? One of those guys. Uh, the Merchants Bank of New York, also founded in that same crew of gentlemen. Uh, the Massachusetts Land Trust, the Massachusetts Electric Company, and then eventually the Rockefeller model of trusts, which is an absolutely insane trust map where you can actually see that every single company structure in every sector is this massive web tree that's all connected to a master trust that nobody knows anything about and could get any information about. All they know is that all of these sub trusts point somewhere, but they can't ever get information about it because those sub trusts are designed to be private contracts. And those private contracts own all of those companies. So as much of the assets of those companies, they want to simply slide right off the board. No problem. They just slide it right into the private contract side. And then, of course, recently, the Kennedy model. <laughs> because these kinds of things have been used over and over again and refined and refined and refined. The Irrevocable Express Trust is a private, lawful, valid business organization. It stands on its own. It has the right to own property, protect a trustee's physical persona, engage in business transactions, reduce and incur liabilities, including tax liabilities, depending on the activity which renders it liable to pay such tax. So we'll get into all these little pieces a little bit more, but we also should say that a express trust is a private contract doing business under the general law of contracts. And here's the trick about that. As long as no benefit or privilege or franchise from any government or outside party is received, the trust owes no duty to any government or outside party to the extent that no common law criminal or civil wrong has been committed. Meaning, as long as you're not breaking the law, and I'll talk about some of the things that definitely will break your trust, because they're breaking common and natural law in doing so, and it's stuff that you're probably not going to do, like kill people. Don't kill people. Right? Bad idea. But interestingly enough, receiving no benefit or privilege also means that the structure of the trust doesn't ask for permission, doesn't ask for a license, doesn't have the government say, you get our stamp of approval, congratulations, you now have a trust. And it also means that you want to operate carefully in the financial world, meaning that if you're using a bank account connected to one of these trusts, you use a non-interest-bearing banking account. You guys ever heard of that? A non-interest-bearing account? Now, I mean, why would anybody do that? Because, I mean, after all, I'm going to get 1.25% over the next five years, you know, from my bank account. Woo! Like, interest for the win. Well, you know, some people have done a significant analysis of interest in banking accounts versus depreciation of the dollar and have found that the interest given by banking accounts is always less than the depreciation of the dollar. So the bank doesn't lose anything there. No way. The dollar value is going down and you're just basically seeing a little growth because your money's inflating, but less than the rest of the money that the bank is holding. Make sense? So receiving interest in a banking account is a form of asking to receive a privilege in exchange for what? Well, we're going to go deeper into that and that's where the game of taxation comes in. All right? 
With Express Trusts, the contract makes the law. The terms and the provisions of this trust will establish the entire contractual agreement, including the positions of the parties, the name, the situs, all the, all the good stuff, right? So the trust basically becomes its own law. And that law is within its own common jurisdiction and natural jurisdiction. That law is not within the jurisdiction of a judge. Meaning if your trust gets brought in front of a judge for something like anything, <laughs> you basically show the judge in a private room. You say, can I have, see you aside for a second, your honor? I have some paperwork regarding this. You show him that you have a private common law trust that is basically protecting exactly what you want it to in it that is under threat of lawsuit or whatever by whoever else and the judge is compelled at that moment to throw it out of the court he cannot continue with the case he cannot take the case because taking the case would be a violation of his oath to govern over statutory law not common law the judge cannot touch it Ever wonder why all the stuff just gets thrown out of court when these bad guys do really bad stuff? Okay, this is magic that's been being used against the people for a very long time and in very bad ways. And it is our prerogative and our opportunity to get together, take control of that magic, to regather these threads of wisdom and learn how to use it for good for the gift of what it's really designed to be, which is the entrusting of love and goodness and sovereignty and health and peace and abundance for all people, for all time, for all life. Thank you very much. Once you declare a, a private irrevocable express trust, it's a legal entity. It's got a bona fide, separate and distinct jurisdictional personality. That's what I was just talking about. Here's some of the cases in case you're interested. In uh, this one court case, the court held the express trust is a contractual relationship based on trust form. Any law or procedure in its operation denying or obstructing contract rights impairs Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution. It's unconstitutional for it to do that. And the express trust, because it's created by natural right, which cannot be abridged, it's protected under federally enforceable right of contract law and not under laws passed by any of the several state legislators. Unfreaking breakable, invincible, not touchable. <laughs> and while an express trust can exercise rights similar to corporations, the express trust, when properly executed, is in no way meant to be confused with being a corporate entity which operates under legislative statutory law. Corporations, on the other hand, are fictional entities that come with benefits and privileges and statutory jurisdiction. Because when you apply for a corporation, what are you doing? You're going and you're saying, hey, can I have permission to have a tax ID number, please? Will you send me a tax ID number so I can please pay you a bunch of my money? because I believe in how you're going to spend my taxes. Once upon a time, in the days when we believed that when we paid our taxes, it was going to go to paying those teachers in the schools, you know, that all that money was going to just pave our roads in gold. And oh, 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 the schools would thrive and oh, the people would thrive and there would be no one starving on the corner. There would be no homeless. We would, we would house them all and we would feed them all and it would be good. It would be good. $70 trillion in the defense budget under Trump this last time. What? Seven, tr like, wait, what? Like, hold on. <laughs> hey, wait a second. My numbers may not be accurate, but the amount is absolutely insane. It's obscene. And what is that money being used for? Oh, it's to protect all of our common interests by creating plenty of weapons and bombs to destroy, to kill, to threaten. I don't know, I broke my trust. I believed that it was possible. I believed, I believed that we could drive our tax money to good. I believed that for a lot of my life. I believe it for a long time. And, uh, you know, politically, I hardly ever go there, but like I'm Bernie guy all the way. I mean, I freaking love Bernie. I'm like, yeah, 
yes, Bernie, like give it back to the people. Thank you so freaking much. Stand for the rights of the little man. And what I realized is that Bernie trying to get all of these guys to pay taxes that are these most powerful men, you know, these families, these gargantuan corporations, the Jeff Bezos of the world, they are never going to pay those taxes. They're never going to support that stuff through the tax system. Why? Because they don't even own anything. They have it all in trusts, protected. <laughs> and no, they're not going to pay that wealth. When I used to be a speaker at the White House, I engaged with a lot of different people from different backgrounds. And the White House aides at the time that I talked to in the Obama administration were very clear with me. And they said, you know what? You guys are here because we can't make the changes that need to be made. The bureaucratic structure and the way things are set up, we are not going to be able to make the big change. You kids, you guys, you're the ones that are going to have to create something new and different. You're going to have to create a system that transcends and includes. So that's what I'm still trying to do. <laughs> uh, I mean, every day. That's what I'm doing in tech. That's what I'm doing in everything else. And I believe this is a big part of it. This part of it is about understanding the way this system and this structure works so that we can create better agreements with each other, better contracts, better protect our assets, and better give philanthropically to the causes that we believe in rather than just expecting that someday we're going to get some president that's just going to manage to fix everything. It's just not going to happen, guys. I'm sorry to break it to you. You know, those young hopefuls out there that are 18 and 19 and like, go, oh, you know, I'm like 39 at this point And I'm like, yep, I kind of get it. It's a little bit jaded, but it is dealing with the truth of what's really going on. So I hope that this is beneficial to you guys. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Value our assets. So. The express trust puts the estate entirely in one or more persons, while others have a beneficial interest, but neither are partners or agents. Blah, 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 blah. Basically, to create one of these trusts, you have to do a couple really smart things. And we're going to cover exactly what those things are and how to do them right. And we will know how to do it right because of this guy named Carlton Albert Weiss. In the 1970s and 80s, he was a private investigator and lawyer who made it his life work to try to pierce corporations, companies, trusts. He was the guy that you hire when that evil corporation steals the house out from under you. And you need him to try to figure out how to pierce into the company's assets and actually get you some money back so you get your house back. Right? He was the guy. And he went in there like a roaring knight. And he figured out how to pierce nearly every kind of company structure and trust structure that exists. And he found a commonality in all of them. They were all subject to statutory law. And he realized, wait a second, those trusts that I can't pierce, they must not even be operating in statutory law. The judges must not even be touching it. That's what's going on. He was also a collector of antique law books. And so because of some of his work, we now know this sort of history of trusts that led us to now and why this private trust structure is so powerful. So something that's important to understand as we look at the way we can use this kind of vehicle to relate to the government and you know to the world at whole and how we interface with all of that is understanding what's called types of citizenship. Many people don't understand, but in our country, in the United States here, we have many different kinds of citizens. There's the we the people, which is the true sovereigns, power of natural law, the state citizen, the state republic, which is granted power by the citizens, by the trust of the Constitution, the United States, which is granted power by each of the states, right, as the representative, and the citizen of the United States, which is a 14th Amendment citizen, and that's everybody. <laughs> that's all of us peoples. 
We are no longer the we the people. We are no longer the state citizen as long as we are operating within statutory law and within the functions of the 14th Amendment. We are known as a citizen of the United States and we actually don't have rights in the way that you think we do. What we have is privileges and benefits and we receive those privileges and benefits in exchange for certain things including our taxation. So the question is, how do we get back up that ladder to the true natural law and to the higher states of sovereignty within this ladder? How do we get back out of the states controlling us to us being the people that established the states? And the answer is this vehicle, this kind of trust, because it stands as a state citizen. In other words, it doesn't exist in the power of the states anymore. It's way back up there by we the people. And lawfully, it may do what any other human may. It is sui juris. In other words, it acts independently of all others. This is a sovereign structure. It can sue and be sued in the name of the trust. It can maintain its private jurisdiction by not accepting benefits or privileges from outside parties or governments. It is extraordinarily powerful vehicle that once again restores in a, in a container form, in a magical sort of spell casting form, your sovereign citizenship level. The level that you had before we created this agreement that we all fell into, the constitution and the states and all of the stuff, right? But that constitution still protects our ability to be restored in this way, which is pretty cool. So how do we set it up? Well, you define the parameters of your trust contract, what its role is, what its protections are, and its purpose, and you have to determine a grantor to work with you to assist in setting it up that passes something called the control test. Now, the control test is really, really critical piece. I'm going to talk about that in a second. And then you notarize it. You and the grantor, you go, you get in front of a notary, and you do this like magical thing where you're like, watch me sign this. And they're like, I saw you sign that. <laughs> and it's like the pageantry is complete. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you have now done magic and you have now created this incredible thing. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? <laughs> we humans are so strange. This planet is just ridiculous. Um, so the control test, this is absolutely critical and it is why most trusts fail. Most trusts are created where someone thinks, oh, well, I, okay, I'm going to create a trust with my family, but let's see. I own this piece of property, so I'm going to entrust my son as the trustee of this property, and he can make his children the beneficiaries, right? But what you've just done in this case is you've actually just said, I'm the trust, my son is the trust, and the children are the trust. So that's... In persona conjuncta is what they call it. And that means that you can't be distinguished from the trust because you're the owner of the property. You're passing it to your child. They're passing it to their child. There's no difference than if it was just you. Interesting. So that means that if anybody sues that or tries to take that property from you or whatever, it's coming right at you. There is no structure protecting it. So the control test says... What you actually have to have is an adverse party as the grantor. So this is the big, you know, one of the big secrets they have kept in their wraps. You just get a neighbor. <laughs> you get a friend. You get somebody who you're not related to, you're not partnership with, and you say, okay, check it out. I'm going to hand you this gold coin right here, the silver coin, this nice silver dollar I got, you know, at the margarita shop. <laughs> you know, and, and, and you're like, okay. You're going to give me that silver dollar. You're going to grant me that silver dollar. And I'm going to be the trustee of that silver dollar. And as the trustee of that silver dollar, I will ensure that the value of that silver dollar grows. And that whatever happens within this trust that I am the trustee of, that I am entrusted with, will be passed to the beneficiaries. And those beneficiaries shall be my children. Or they shall be these lands. Or the, it shall be these nonprofits that I'm choosing to donate to. Right? And, and so the grantor is like, okay, cool. So I just give this back to you. And you're like, yep, just give it back to me. Sign this paper with me. It's your trust document. It's your coin. 
but they are granting that coin to you that crafts a trust that is now granted to a trustee and you are distant from the grantor, the original owner, and you do not own that coin anymore. You are just in control of it. And everything that goes into that trust, you are in control of as a trustee, but it is owned by the trust. Whoa. You guys get that? Crazy, right? What a crazy trick. Baked into the heart of the whole thing. Okay, I'll just get my homie to give me it, and then I could pretend that it was not mine. And now anything within this magical spellcasting container contains and owns everything like this magical illusion, and, and I just move it around. It's amazing. It gets deeper. You want to go deeper? <laughs> Freaking A. So how do you operate as a trustee? Let's get, let's get a few of the details out of the way here. All of your business cards and your checks and your bills and your letterheads must contain some of these identifiers. This is one of the kind of flags used by the elites to say, hey, hey, oh yeah, I know what an ETO is, mofos. Express trust organization. You see that ETO on a business card, somebody knows what they're doing, right? It's like elite passcode. <laughs> and all signatures by a trustee must contain one of the following by Adam Apollo as trustee and not personally, or Adam Apollo without recourse to trustee. And what that means is it says, I'm signing this on behalf of that magical spell that I call a trust and not as myself. So if you come after it, you're just coming after the magical spell and not me, right? Without recourse to me. And all your contracts and your disclaimers have to have the following clauses, and it just is basically saying, this agreement is governed and interpreted in natural law, a court of common law is demanded, you know, our principal situs, wherever we're located, wherever we live, that's where we have to deal with arbitration if you try to do anything legally to me, and we'll arbitrate, et cetera, and claimants shall render payment for it, blah, blah, blah and the trust is liable for its obligations, the trustee and the interest holders not held liable are not held liable personally. It's basically some legal jargon that further reinforces the spell and says, this is natural law, this is how this is going to operate, and if you ever try to fuck with me, this is what's going down. All right? And where possible, you want to avoid mixing any of your personal and trust addresses. So you want to get like a separate address box, you know, an actual address box. Pay one of those places that has an address, not a P.O. box, right? And phone number, get a separate number for it, other kinds of things. You just want to avoid one simple thing, in persona conjuncta. So it's not you, it's a trust. It's not the same. You are not the trust, the trust is not you. It has a separate address, it has a separate phone number. You guys get it? Separate container. And if trust and personal affairs are mixed too heavily, you run into trouble. So don't mingle your personal funds and your trust funds. And I'm going to talk about how to deal with money and, and deal with your trust in that way. And always put your ETO, Express Trust Organization, on all the documents. Always sign without recourse to trustee. And always put the clauses on the contracts. One, two, three, four. It's not that hard. I mean, you make these things seem really complex, but they're really, it's really not that hard. It's A, B, C, D, and you're going to have all the materials when I'm done that you need to do all of this stuff. So how can a trust be broken? Well, you murder someone, you know, you rob banks, you do manslaughter, rape, sodomy, larceny, mayhem, burglary, assaults, all these kinds of things. Don't do that stuff. That's common law. Just don't do it. It's not okay. <laughs> It's against the common natural law of being alive and being part of a community that's on this planet together. So as long as you don't do all that stuff, you're good. But the good thing is, is that if you do that stuff, it can break your trust, right? And this is one of the ways that really great investigators and legal teams have been able to get some of the bad guys. Because they've managed to find and prove that they are breaking these kind of common law level agreements. And once they can do that, they can pierce in there and they can get it. They can actually break down, start breaking down the structure. 
But a lot of those really bad guys, they create these trust webs that are so many layers deep, it's really difficult. It takes a long time, decades sometimes, for them to get to the heart of it. When you commingle personal funds and trust funds, you get in persona conjuncta, as I said. Don't do that. And if you're tax obligated and you refuse to pay, in other words, when you haven't redeemed money as lawful money, which I'm going to talk about, that's also another way that you can be screwed. Taxes are not fundamentally illegal. You're making an agreement to pay them whenever you receive benefits from the government. And we have benefits of a lot of kinds. I'm going to talk about that, including the benefit of your social security number. <laughs> That's a benefit that you're given that, that also entitles you to a driver's license and also entitles you to a passport. So taxes are legal, but there are ways that you don't have to pay them if you don't choose to because it turns out taxes are optional, and we're going to get there. So how do we create an effective structure? Like, How do we do like a multi-layer magic spell that's really cool that will protect everything that we're creating? Well, one of the ways to do it is something we call the trust web. And the trust web is basically a formula and pattern that you can use to set things up that creates this extraordinarily powerful barrier. And the barrier is the barrier between the public and the private side of your life and the world. It all comes back to that trinity. What is public and what is private? Corporations are public. Vehicles you drive need licenses. They're public, right? But how you own and control and who owns those things, that can be private. And the way that you can set that up is you create something called a pass-through trust. And the pass-through trust basically has what's called a UCC1 lien on the company, on the property. And a UCC1 lien is something you file with the government and you say, here's, a, here's the basic example. I can set up a C-Corp and I can say, I'm filing this UCC1 lien. I have this pass-through trust. And the pass-through trust says that that company that I'm creating owes that trust a hundred trillion dollars. <laughs> Seriously, I can say whatever I want. It's my private agreement. So this company that I created owes a hundred billion dollars, a hundred million dollars, whatever you think you might ever have in your lifetime. You can go a hundred trillion if you want. Why not? It's cool. All the money that that corporation will ever own is owed to the trust. Do you get what I'm saying? The government's like, whoa, that company owes a lot of money to that trust. But they've seen this kind of paperwork before, and they know. They're like, oh, yeah, we know what's happening here. And that pass-through trust has a private UCC1 lien that's not filed. It's not given to the government. And it says there's a master trust or a holding trust if you want to take extra layers of precautionary steps here. The three gold stars you see on the screen there, those are the required structures. The rest are all optional. So for the moment, we'll just say a, a, a master trust. And that master trust, that holding trust owes $100 trillion to you also. So meaning the company owes $100 trillion to the pass-through trust. The pass-through trust owes $100 trillion to the master trust. But if anybody looks at where the money is under control of by that company, that C-class corporation that you've created, somebody's like, how come you're not paying taxes on this money in the bank? Well, you just say, well, that money is actually owned and controlled by this holding trust. And you show them the information about the holding trust, and they're like, okay. Can they ever see the actual master trust? No. They can never go past that stage. It's level two bulletproofing. <laughs> bulletproofing, right? It's saying like, no, the, the assets in the company are not taxable. They're owned and controlled by a trust. And then they're like, well, who owns that trust? Well, that trust is, looks like it's owned and controlled by another trust. Too bad. Can't ever find anything out about that. It's really powerful. And that, that master trust can also be a holding trust. 
You can have an additional layer if you want, or the master trust can do this. And the master trust can have a home trust that actually owns and controls a home property. It can have a surety trust, which provides insurance and the, the lien to any kind of vehicles, boats, properties, planes, etc. Right. So the surety trust is kind of on that barrier of public and private because you do have to buy and register insurance. Right. So it's kind of hugging the line, just like the pass through trust. The pass through trust has to file a UCC one lien with the government saying that there's this money owed to it by this company. So they're they're holding the line, but they're still crossing on the public side, meaning that they're still exposed. And as soon as you go past that. You enter the private sector, and once you've gone into the private sector, anything that's going on on that side is completely untouchable. And how do you do accounting for this kind of thing? Well, you just have the money in a bank account held by the C Corporation, and you literally just have your own private ledger that says, I'm moving this money into the trust. It moves into the holding trust. You keep a separate ledger that says I'm moving that into my private trust, my master trust. That's it. There is no money in that corporation. It doesn't matter how much is in there. It's owned and controlled and owned by another entity. And that entity is a private contract. All right? You guys, yeah. All right. We got it. Yeah. Yeah. So you got you with me. <laughs> so pretty cool, huh? So now, we'll take this even one layer even deeper. You ready? Oh, here we go. Lawful money. Dun, dun, dun. We have the choice when we use our U.S. currency whether we are using debt-based Federal Reserve notes or U.S. Treasury notes. You've all seen a dollar bill. <clears throat> We've all looked at them many, many times. You notice how there's a seal on the left and a seal on the right. Well, the seal on the left says Federal Reserve Bank of State. The seal on the right says the Department of the Treasury date. And on the left, it's signed by the Treasurer of the United States. On the right, it's signed by Secretary of the Treasury. What this means is this bill has two faces and two forms. Every dollar in the United States has this. It is both a U.S. Treasury note and it is a Federal Reserve note. Now it turns out that there's a really deep story behind this one. <laughs> when a private bank like the Federal Reserve prints money on behalf of Congress, they are utilizing a private currency of the Federal Reserves. However, an agreement between the private banks and Congress was reached to print their fiat currency with the ability to redeem in lawful money, gold coins. But that changed in 1861. Immediately after the Civil War, the government implemented legal tender as lawful money and a flat tax for all citizens. This change occurred because President Lincoln's greenback dollars were public federal currency that was seen as a competitor to the private banker's interest in controlling the printing of a company's money, which they have succeeded in doing for nearly every country in the world except for North Korea, Iran, Cuba. You guys recognize those names? <laughs> Oh, man, we hate those countries, don't we? Why? Why? Why are they a threat? Hmm. Lincoln was assassinated by an actor after his bodyguard went for a drink. Andrew Johnson took over, and the bankers had free reign from then on their fourth. Game over. Bankers won. Sorry, guys. Peace out, Lincoln. You were cool. We liked you. So what's really going on here? What's the deeper economic story of what happened? Well, I've done a lot of digging of my own on this one because I've been trying to hunt this down. And I found different insiders and different people that had some pretty amazing knowledge. And, and as I dug in, I was able to find and verify all the parts of the story because they just happened to be on the State Department's website. You just have to know where to look. 
So in order to go to war against England, the colonists borrowed money. Right? They're going to go to war against England. How are they going to get all the guns and all the weapons and all the stuff to do it? Well, there was a few rich guys around. <laughs> and one of those rich families was the Rothschild family. And so the United States, the founding fathers, the guys in the Revolutionary War coming together, borrowed a bunch of money. Now, <clears throat> in the 1790s, those original loans borrowed for the war went into default. They couldn't pay it back. They won the war, but they're, where are they going to get all this money to pay them back? They hadn't gone west yet. They hadn't found all the gold and all the riches promised in the country. So that gave 70 years, basically, which is the cycle for sovereign country bankruptcy. 70 years as a loan cycle to pay back that amount in its entirety or face another negotiation with the loaners. Well, add 70 years to the 1790s, and that puts us right in 1861. 1861, the loans couldn't be repaid. So what happened was they were like, well, you better give us all the gold and silver you have. So guess what? All that gold and silver gets moved out of all the banks. And what do all the banks have to do and the government has to do? Sorry, guys, we can't redeem your cash in gold and silver anymore. We had to pay it back to the guys that we owed money to from when we started the country. There goes all the gold and silver and no more no more gold-backed currency. No more gold backs. Can't just take your dollar and get gold out of the bank. And instead, you now have a lawful money currency that is optional. You can choose to opt to use it as lawful money as if it was gold and silver, but you have to choose that. Otherwise, you're just using a borrowed debt note. Why? Because the entire country's in debt. <laughs> All right? Stage three, still didn't pay them off, right? That didn't do it. So you add 70 years, and you get 1933. Absolute end of the gold standard. No longer is the currency backed by gold at all. No more. And gold is now removed. The U.S. is bankrupt. But guess what? That still wasn't enough. Boy, those guys must have put some serious interest on those loans to go to war. <laughs> and so what happens? 70 years later, 2001. Donald Rumsfeld announced the day before on September 10th, 2001, that the U.S. government had lost $7 trillion. Hmm. Interesting, isn't that? Public record. You can look that up. But no worries. The U.S. government has moved all the records into the records room in the Pentagon, and we'll find it next day, 9-11, the towers fall. And guess what part of the Pentagon was hit by a plane slash missile slash WTF? Guess. The one area they cleared everybody out of, the one area where the records room for what happened to that $7 trillion existed. Huh. Interesting. And it's believed that the gold was moved out of the vault in the World Trade Center basement 10 days earlier using 21 dump trucks over a three-day period between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. The 911 complaint calls from local people near the World Trade Center towers confirmed it each day. What well, was all that trash they were taking out? Boy, it was a bunch. Well, that trash was the gold, and that was the last of it. <laughs> so, huh, what is our money really backed by? Who really owns all this money anyway? Is there such thing as owning money? <laughs> There's this all just one big magical illusion that we're all playing a part in. Well, welcome to the red pill, ladies and gentlemen. So what does this mean? It means that the banks are bankrupt. It means the U.S. government is bankrupt. The bank can't issue gold or U.S. bank notes. And there's no lawful dollars out there. There's just credit and debt ledger entries. 
and no one gets prepaid for anything of valuable substance except for lawful money. The IRS can't tax credit, debt, or barter. Congress licensed the use of Federal Reserve notes to be used as money, but they're basically fancy IOUs, and that as a medium of exchange for the discharge of public and private debt into the bankruptcy. With that definition, the Federal Reserve notes became contraband, and that gives BATFEED your jurisdiction, BAT, B -A -T, I forget what the whole thing stands for, over its use and transfer, only the private credit that is, and the public credit, just like trafficking in alcohol, guns, drugs, tobacco, or other substances, is subject to excise taxes. In other words, in very short form, when you use dollars, you are actually using a debt note that's a form of contraband which has a tax right applied to it, an excise tax. That's what it is. And as long as you're using Federal Reserve notes, you're just playing along with the excise tax game. That's it. But you know what's so crazy? All you have to do is choose to use lawful money instead. And when you choose to use lawful money, you basically can do all kinds of incredible things. You can actually choose when you're setting up your bank account to tell the bank that you are depositing lawful money, treasury notes, not Federal Reserve notes. And when you deposit treasury notes, guess what? Income is not taxable. It's the privilege of using the Federal Reserve notes that's taxable. Income is not a tax. You can't tax somebody for earning money. No. And I'll show you exactly that in a second. So there's only direct taxes and indirect taxes. This is in all the legal stuff when you really get into all the documents. And 16th Amendment limits the power of taxation. Income tax is an indirect or an excise tax meaning it's due to an event. That event is you using a Federal Reserve note. Receiving income is not a right or a privilege. There's no benefit or license needed for that. You can do that without the government being involved. Federal Reserve notes are elastic legal tender. Unless objected to, Federal Reserve notes are received as private credit. In other words, when you deposit them in banks, banks assume you're using the Federal Reserve note, and so does the IRS. You have to notify them that you're not anymore. This is some like magic stuff that, you know, we can do. And benefits, rights received, and licenses result in corporate taxes. Federal Reserve notes redeemed as lawful money avoid a taxable event. And there are special kinds of deposit accounts that let you hold gold and silver as well. And what you really want to do is deposit lawful money and then convert it to a commodity like gold or silver. And then hold as much of that as you need. And that just makes it unbelievably bulletproof, right? The IRS doesn't allow or follow any other lower court's rulings on this anymore. They only go with Supreme Court rulings, meaning that there's a specialized team of lawyers in the IRS that when they receive your return and it's claiming your lawful money as a return, which is how you do it, then basically what happens is the IRS passes it up, passes it up, passes it up, and eventually it gets to that group of lawyers, and they're like, okay, this person is redeeming in lawful money. Just drop it. Stop asking them. And they drop it, and they send you your refund. All the money you deposited, all the money you had withdrawn that you claim was lawful money comes back to you, and it takes about a year. So be patient with it if you have money already being withdrawn from you. If you haven't paid the taxes, in other words, you're depositing as lawful money and you're in control and you're running your own business and your own company, you just don't pay in and you file as if it's lawful money. It's still going to take them a while to come around to it, but once it is, that money, run as lawful money, done correctly and appropriately, is a non-taxable event. Yeah, exciting. <laughs> This is kind of cool stuff. Um, <clears throat> so Steve Miller, former director of the Internal Revenue Service, uh, admitted that taxes were voluntary in the Ways and Means Committee hearing on June 27, 2013. Only federal employees are mandated to pay taxes. And when questioned at the House Ways and Means Committee hearing, Miller told House Representative Devin Nunes that America's tax system is voluntary. Very directly. He can't lie. He has to say it. It has to be public. And when Nunez remarked for clarification that, wait, 
the U.S. tax code is a voluntary system? Miller said, agreed. Okay, so there's the head of the IRS. You can go look that up. It's available. <laughs> Public records. Final critical notes on lawful money. One must file a return for all the tax that's withheld after a year of demanding and redeeming money as lawful money. The IRS sends back the taxes and interest held on those held funds. That's why you got to keep really good records. Doing this kind of trust thing just means you got to get on top of actually having a good ledger and doing good records. It's a stretch. It's working me a lot. I don't like doing that stuff. But I'm learning so much from it, and it's so amazing. The IRS marks lawful money redemption internally as income from a non-taxable source to quell questions from lower-level employees. And no one should ever avoid, evade, paying, filing taxes. Taxes are legal and lawful and necessary. Taxes are not theft except by misassumption, meaning that they're stealing from us because we just don't even know it. <laughs> we just assume that we should, you know? It's, it's what it is. And it's okay, because we can change that. We can choose to operate differently. So the basic steps of this process are that you complete and establish a trust contract. And when you create this trust contract, I'm going to give you a great template to do it. And then you just add in what the protections are, you know, what the specific beneficiaries are of the trust, how the trustees are going to operate. A lot of that's laid out, but you can modify it yourself. You prepare a C-class corporate registration. The reason we do C-class companies is that as a public entity, it's the most protective one. It's, it's already built to be really protective. Why do you think all the biggest companies in the world are C-class corporations in the United States? They chose that for a reason. <laughs> it's not a mistake. An LLC means you are the LLC. You know that, right? You are the LLC. There is no other protective barrier there. It's just you, right? And so it's crucial to understand this and that some, some different kinds of public-facing structures are better than others. You can have your public-facing structure be an operating trust. In other words, it can be another trust that you create in this same exact way, except that it's really hard to get a non-interest-bearing checking account for a private trust organization that you go to the bank with. You'll go to a bunch of banks and some will take it, some will fail. And it's, it's, it's difficult. And there are a lot of other difficulties because you're basically trying to operate a private-like structure in a public space. And it just makes for a lot of stickiness. It's a lot easier to have a public, acceptable organization, like a C-corporation, and just have everything in that corporation owned and controlled by a holding trust, well, pass-through trust, holding trust, master trust, or pass-through trust, master trust, right? And that way, you can just do everything you would normally do with the C-class corporation, which it's super easy to get, you know, uh, you know, an accountant for that. Super easy to, to you know, figure out the basics of setting up bank accounts. You got tax ID numbers, all that kind of stuff. It's just a much simpler vehicle. Then what you do once you've kind of prepared your C-corp, you've prepared the name of that, what you want to call the pass-through trust, the private trust. You've got those structures. Then you basically notarize the trusts with the grantor who gives you something that you just gave him but he gives it to you it passes the control test you're an adverse party you know you're not my family you're not my partner you're not my wife to be you're not my business partner you're a neighbor your friend you're somebody that cares about me enough to do this with me go to the notary and they do that with you and basically that establishes the control test you've now established the trusts they now exist that's it they're real and then you go and you file your C-corporation, and then you file the UCC-1 lien that says everything owned in that corporation is actually under ownership of a trust. The corporation has a massive debt to pay, and so anything that goes into that account is functionally belongs to the trust. And then you create a private lien between the holding trust and the master trust, you know, or the pass-through trust and the master trust, or both. And you create a non-interest bearing checking account for the C corporation and you start depositing money as lawful money. When you create that account, you say, I want to, I want to create this account in lawful money. And you can actually write in lawful money on the account contracts and in the documents that you'll see that I'm sending that are due to the 
amazing, amazing work of the Private Wealth Academy crew. And uh, if you guys are interested in the Private Wealth Academy course, which is a course that I took as well, that informed me and taught me so much and integrated so much of the work I'd already done um, and helped me get all of this information to the state that it's in now that I could actually, you know, teach it and pass it on like this. So please support these guys. They're amazing. You will get access to a Google Drive that contains within it all of the documents, templates, legal resources, legal history, all of the records of past, you know, cases, etc., that you could possibly need to create this, to defend yourself in court, to create and work with lawful money and create an account using lawful money, and it is a massive package, and I highly, highly recommend you explore it and deep dive into it. So you can look into any kind of organizational structure, and what I showed you today is if it follows that model, that literally there is a specific process, you're going about creating it privately, you're not asking for, for, for permission, and you're doing it with the right kind of language and spell casting, you can attain the same level of, of, of protection. It's just that this kind of trust, this is something that some of the wealthiest people in the world and the elites have been using for a long time, and there are countless Supreme Court cases defending it over and 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 over again, which is why this kind of organization, if you end up in court with it, the judges just throw it out. They will not touch it. They don't want to be debarred. They don't want to lose their license. And a lot of judges already know how to do this because they went through law school and they figured out some of this if they were smart. And so a lot of judges don't want any of this to be public or get out there because that's going to screw their pooch, right? And why am I making this public now? Why are we doing this right now? Because I believe this is essential to us as light workers and guardians of the planet to protecting our assets, protecting each other's asses, <laughs> and getting out there and making big change in the world and doing it the way that it should be done. Thank you, guys. That's me, by the way, in case any of you guys want to check out some of my different projects and work. I have Academy for Unified Physics and uh, uh, Academy for Jedi, Guardian Alliance, uh, some Galactic Downloads, Unify, some fun stuff. AdamApollo.com, you can find all of my work. It's, it's, all, it's all out there.